Hi everyone and welcome back to Learn Your Radiology. I'm Brent Weinberg, the founder of LearnNeuroRadiology.com. Today we're going to continue our brain imaging capstone course. This is going to be part five where we're going to talk about common imaging pathology. Now in the previous videos we've talked about modalities used in brain imaging. We've talked a little bit about how you might choose an appropriate imaging modality and we've gone through some of the basics of reviewing brain cases on your own. If you haven't seen any of those videos I encourage you to go back and check those out if you're interested because today we're going to focus on some of the common imaging pathology you might run into on CT and MRI of the brain. Then some of the subsequent videos are going to give you some cases that you can go through on your own, review on your own time with videos to kind of walk you through them once you're finished. The common imaging pathologies of the brain are stroke, hemorrhage, hydrocephalus, tumor, and infection. These are the things we're going to cover today. It's some of the most common things you'll see when imaging the brain, the most common things you'll run into in inpatient practice, and if you're a non-radiologist particularly, some things that really can make you a better consumer and order of your own imaging. So we're going to go through these one at a time. So let's just jump right in. So stroke is the occlusion of blood flow to the brain, and so it's damage to the brain by impaired oxygen delivery to the brain. Most commonly, this is from arterial interruption, so you lose blood flow by losing neurocarotid artery or radial artery, for instance, or one of the smaller cerebral arteries, such as the ACA or MTA. You can also have venous infarcts, and in those cases, you're just unable to deliver blood to the brain because the outflow is obstructed, and you can't get enough oxygen there for that reason. Now, your imaging features, most commonly what you're going to see, particularly on a CT, is a loss of gray-white differentiation, so you're no longer going to be able to tell the difference between gray matter and white matter. Now that abnormality is also going to be in a vascular territory, so that's going to be a nice clue that you're dealing with a vascular pathology. Now if you see this on a CT, many times you're going to want to move on to vascular imaging. If it's early, such as in the first 6 to 24 hours, you're probably going to get a CT angiogram. If it's a little bit later, you might get it as an MR angiogram as part of a complete like stroke MR workup. Now common complications of stroke include herniation and hemorrhage, so these are things that you want to be on the lookout for as you're evaluating the imaging. So here we see a CT from a 17 year old that has endocarditis, has right sided weakness. If we're evaluating this CT, anytime I look at a CT, I want to look and I want to see gray matter coating the white matter everywhere that I look. And as I come around to this left side around here in the left frontal lobe, I kind of lose that gray white differentiation and have this area of diffuse hypodensity that kind of takes up the majority of the left MCA distribution, kind of in this whole left hemisphere. A little bit of sparing of this posterior territory back here. Now, this patient went on to have a CT angiogram. This is an axial MIP image from angiogram here. You see on the normal right side, you've got the internal carotid artery, the MCA here, the ACA coming off, and it looks normal. On the abnormal side, you've got the ICA, the ACA sort of turning uh, posteriorly here, and then the MCA is abruptly truncated in the M1 segment right here in the ciliated fissure, and that's a thrombus in the MCA. So this is an acute MCA occlusion. Here you see on an MRI, you just confirm that this patient has a large left MCA infarct. So on diffusion, you've got a very diffusion bright area. The corresponding ADC is actually quite dark. So you're just confirming that that's an area that has a restricted diffusion. Uh, it's anavascular territory. This is what a classic left MCA infarct looks like. Now this is the appearance of stroke over time. You can see we were dealing with very early imaging that we were seeing there. The loss of gray white differentiation in that MCA territory. You can see with time it probably gets a little bit darker, a little bit better defined, but on the second day it still looks kind of similar. After day seven, in this particular case, you develop some hyperdensity and a gyriform distribution along the cortex here. That's a little bit of cortical necrosis, which is deposition of blood products in that cortex uh, due to essentially petechial hemorrhage or leakage of blood products through dying blood vessels. Here you see by day 22 that blood has washed out. You're sort of losing volume now, so your volume effect is negative. You see this ventricle is a little bit bigger, and it's starting to get lower density, like closer to CSF, and you'll see that over time. Now, on that last case, or we saw cortical necrosis. Now, cortical necrosis, like I said, is microhemorrhage into the cortex. It kind of follows this gyriform pattern. You'll hear the term laminar necrosis used. That's really the pathologic term to talk about necrosis of the layers of the cortex. Uh, due to necrosis of the vessels that go along with them, you get hyperdensity in there, and that's going to wash out with time as minimal mass effect. It's not really considered a hemorrhagic conversion because it, it doesn't have mass effect, and you can continue to have these patients on anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy if you need to. Now, you need to be familiar with these cerebral vascular territories. These images are taken from Radiopedia. You can see the ACA territory is anterior and along the midline. 
the PCA territory is posteriorly and along the midline, and the MCA is along the, uh, the middle here. Um, and so as you go higher, the MCA makes up this wedge, which is the largest uh, portion of the cerebral hemisphere, ACA anteriorly and PCA posteriorly. So if you see a pathology in a territory like this, you should be thinking about an underlying vascular lesion such as a stroke. This is what a chronic infarct looks like. You can see it's a different patient, also an MCA infarct, but a subtotal. You can see this small area here. It's lower density, closer to the density of the ventricle. You see some ex vacuo dilation of the ventricle here, so volume loss, and the margins are pretty well defined. And so that, uh, that can definitely help you recognize a chronic infarct there. So in summary, infarct is the death of tissue due to loss of blood flow or specifically loss of oxygenation. You should follow vascular territory. We usually do a CT first. We'll follow that up with MRI and vascular imaging. Be aware of complications such as hemorrhage, herniation, and eventually that's going to lose volume, be about as dark as CSF. We'll call that encephalomalacia. The second pathology we're going to talk about today is hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is the development of acute blood products within the brain. We characterize that by what location it occurs in. Commonly, we'll see it in the subarachnoid space or in the CSF. Extraaxial hemorrhages, such as subdural hematomas and epidural hematomas, can also occur. Or you can get bleeding in the brain parenchyma itself. And each of those has like a little bit of a different uh, cause that's the most common. Now, when we do screening for hemorrhage, we almost always do it by CT because these patients are coming in with acute symptoms. Acute blood is almost always more dense than the surrounding structures, which on CT is really helpful. So when you're doing the screening exam, you're looking for something that's more dense. This is also taken from Radiopedia. Uh, this is the density of hemorrhage over time. You see the density on the y-axis here in household units. You see early on, it's very dense. It can be up to 80, 90 household units. Within three to five days, it probably gets closer to gray matter. And over time, it becomes uh, less dense. So you'll have a chronic hemorrhage. It can be, can be less dense there. Now, the evolution varies a lot by based on the size, based on the location, how healthy the patient is, like things like that. So you can see a lot of variation of this. But the general trend always remains that it starts dense and gets less dense over time. One of the most common hemorrhages you'll see is subarachnoid hemorrhage. That's hemorrhage in the subarachnoid spaces surrounding the brain or the CSF spaces. The most common cause overall is trauma. In the absence of trauma, the most common cause is aneurysm rupture. So you'll see these relatively common. If you do see subarachnoid hemorrhage, the next step is often to get a CT angiogram to look for that underlying vascular cause. Here you see a CT in a 46-year-old patient that has confusion. You'll note that it's abnormal right away. You see hyperdense material in the sylvian fissures, the basal cisterns here, wrapping around the midbrain. You see that the temporal horns of the ventricles are enlarged, so the patient also has some hydrocephalus. As you come up higher in the brain, you just confirm those findings. You see hydrocephalus here, enlargement of these ventricles with a more kind of bean-like shape, the loss of that normal concavity. The blood in the sylvian fissure out here and along the convexity, as well as along the quadrigeminal plate and the tentorium here. So this is a classic appearance of what subarachnoid hemorrhage looks like. This patient went on to get a CT angiogram. This is a coronal MIP from a CT angiogram. You can see the basilar artery here, the bilateral PCA, so the right PCA is here. The left PCA is here, and you have this saccular shaped outpouching. Looks like a head on a stick figure here. This is a basilar tip aneurysm, and so that's the likely cause of hemorrhage. Extraaxial hemorrhages are also hemorrhages that are further outside the CSF spaces. They tend to occur along the bony surfaces. Subdural hemorrhage is the most common. These can be from trauma, they can be spontaneous. You can have them particularly if you're on anticoagulation. This is from tearing of the small veins which traverse the dura kind of creates a potential space and will expand there. Epidural hematoma is outside the dura and uh, is almost always associated with a calvarial fracture. And so you hear about this in medical school. These are the ones that can rapidly increase and can be life-threatening if they're not treated. Now here's an example of an 83-year-old. They fell, they're on anticoagulation for some systemic condition. You can see along the right convexity, the brain goes all the way out to the calvarium. As you come across the left, you start to lose in the normal contour of the brain. And when you search for it, you realize it's deflected medially here and you have high density material outside the brain, kind of in a uh, sort of crescent shape. Some of it is a little bit lenticular that can confuse you about whether maybe it's epidural or, or subdural. Here though, you'll note that I've shown you the bone window. There's no underlying fracture there. Here's the coronal suture. So this is actually crossing the coronal suture. Subdural hematomas cross the sutures while epidural hematomas do not. So this is an example of a subdural hematoma. 
Now, if you follow this patient up after a month, what you see is it's become lower density, it's become smaller, you've lost a lot of that mass effect, but you do still have a chronic collection here because you see the brain doesn't go all the way to the calvarium the way it does on the right. Now, parenchymal hemorrhage is hemorrhage within the brain itself, the brain tissue. The location of the hemorrhage can suggest the most common cause for you. Now, the most common by far is going to be a central hemorrhage in the basal ganglia, pons, thalamus, cerebellum. These are very common and by far the most common parenchymal hemorrhages. If you have peripherally located hemorrhages, you might think about underlying causes such as a tumor, metastatic disease, maybe a venous infarct or vascular malformation, or in older patients, you might think about amyloid angiopathy. Most of the time, parenchymal hemorrhage patients are going to get a CTA and or an MRA to look for an underlying lesion, like I said, such as a tumor or vascular malformation. Here's an example of a 61-year-old presenting with new neurologic symptoms. You see in the right thalamus here, you've got a hyperdense structure, pretty well-defined, but significantly denser than the surrounding brain, some edema around it. The coronal images just confirm the same thing, right thalamus, some edema around it, little bit of local mass effect. This is a very classic appearance for a hypertensive hemorrhage in the thalamus. Here you see over time, this is now, you look about nine days later, that hemorrhage has become smaller. It's become less dense. It's become less well-defined. You see decreasing of that mass effect. But this is very typical for what a thalamic hemorrhage will look like over time for a hypertensive thalamic hemorrhage. In summary, hemorrhage is hyperdense to the adjacent brain, gradually decreases over time. We characterize it by location. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is typically caused by trauma or aneurysm. Extraaxial hemorrhage is more associated with anticoagulation, old age, and trauma. Parenchymal hemorrhage is frequently associated with hypertension. And so the location tells you what the likely cause is. Almost all of these patients are going to get vascular imaging and MRI to try to figure out if there's an underlying lesion. Typically, the density of these hemorrhages is going to decrease with time until it's closer to CSF. The next pathology we're going to talk about is hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is enlargement of the ventricles, usually due to decreased resorption or blockage of flow of the CSF. It can be due to increased production if you have a choroid plexus tumor or something like that, but that's more rare. The imaging appearance that you'll see is enlargement of the ventricles. They're going to be too big. They're going to have an abnormal contour. They might have edema around them. Two types of hydrocephalus exist. Communicating, where all the ventricles are enlarged. That's usually a CSF resorption issue, most likely due to hemorrhage or infection can be some other causes, but those are the most common. Obstructive or non-commuting hydrocephalus, you have a lesion blocking the flow of CSF, perhaps at the frame and magnum, perhaps at the cerebral aqueduct, maybe the fourth ventricle, and that's called obstructive or non-communicating hydrocephalus. Here you see a CT from a 56-year-old woman presenting with a headache. You see the ventricles definitely are too big for her age. You see they have this a convex contour where it's usually concave. Both frontal horns are enlarged. The temporal horns usually don't see them that well. They're often kind of slit-like. Here you see again, like same thing, temporal horns are large, frontal horns are large, probably a little bit of edema around it. That's that periventricular edema you can get. Now here you see this same patient compared with a normal patient. You see normally the frontal horns may be shaped like a boomerang or banana here with a concave margin. Here you see they're expanded out and that's very typical. Usually you don't see the temporal horns that well and on this patient they're quite expanded. So that can help you identify hydrocephalus. In acute hydrocephalus, like I said, you do have that edema around it. Here you see a flare image from the patient's MR. There's edema around the frontal horns here, edema around the ventricular atria or occipital horns here. That's usually from venous outflow obstruction. So it's the pressure in the ventricles is compressing the outflow veins, and you get kind of a venous edema. You'll hear that called transependable CSF flow as well, but that's not really, really quite correct. But people will know what you're talking about if you say that. The cause of uh, hydrocephalus in this patient was a tumor kind of a little bit lower at the frame of Monroe. You see on the flare, there's an expansile mass here, kind of obstructing the anterior third ventricle. On post contrast, you see it's avidly enhancing. This was a high grade glioma causing obstruction at the frame of Monroe. So this is an example of obstructive or non communicating hydrocephalus. This patient went on to get a shunt. You can see the ventricles were quite large. And uh, after the shunt, they've got a little post surgical air here along the right frontal convexity maybe a little bit of blood in the ventricle, which is from the operation, but the ventricles themselves are starting to get smaller. So you see some, some improvement of that. Probably seeing a little bit of the top of that tumor there on this image. In summary, hydrocephalus is abnormal increase in the size of the ventricles. It can be acute, and a sign of acute hydrocephalus is edema around the ventricles. You usually don't have that in chronic hydrocephalus. The two types, remember, are communicating, 
where you have the resorption uh, impairment, like uh, with a cerebral hemorrhage or obstructive, where like the case that we saw, where the obstruction is focal, in that case at the frame of Monroe. We'll talk briefly about tumors. Tumors are space occupying intracranial masses. They have mass effects, so they deflect the structures around them. They may have edema or fluid uh, entering the parenchyma in the surrounding areas. They can cause a midline shift or herniation. They can also be associated with hemorrhage, particularly if they're more high grade. Tumors can occur in the brain parenchyma. If they do, that can help uh, tailor your differential diagnosis. Uh, in this case, parenchymal lesions are more likely to be metastases or primary tumors. If they're extraaxial, such as not in the brain parenchyma, the most common brain tumor is a meningioma, and these are extraaxial. The number of lesions can also help tailor your diagnosis. If you have a single lesion, it's more likely to be a primary brain tumor or metastasis. But if you have multiple, you might think about metastatic disease or lymphoma. Now, MRI with contrast is key to fully characterize tumors, and that'll tell you more about it. You'll see if there's any other lesions. So if you see a suspected tumor on a CT, the next step is going to be to do an MRI with contrast. So here you have a 55-year-old man. He has a seizure. Uh, once you see the CT, you start to understand why. You uh, look at the temporal lobe here on the right. It looks normal. The temporal lobe on the left has a lesion in it. It's a rounded lesion, centrally lower density, higher density around the margins with some fluid uh, centrally. The coronal image just kind of lets you see a better view of that, kind of a rounded lesion with a dense wall and centrally kind of cystic or necrotic looking. When you go on to the MRI, what you'll see is you have a lot of edema in that temporal lobe with a central lesion, which is very bright internally, probably from some blood products. On the post-contrast image, what you see is a peripherally enhancing multilobular lesion. This is what a glioblastoma looks like. So this is a new diagnosis of a glioblastoma in the left temporal lobe. Infection. So infection, like hemorrhage in the brain, is characterized by location. If it's in the CSF space, we call it meningitis. If it's in the parenchyma, we call it encephalitis, which might be uh, cere cerebritis if it's in the cerebral hemispheres, or cerebellitis if it's in the cerebellum. Once it becomes walled off and has a wall, we'll call that an abscess. Uh, if you have parenchymal infection, that especially a walled off abscess, it can mimic tumor. Uh, different infections, depending on the type of infection, may or may not enhance. Uh, but you want to be particularly on the lookout in immunocompromised patients. So patients with HIV and stage renal disease, those on immunosuppression for organ transplant or autoimmune diseases. Here's an example of a 73-year-old patient with end-stage renal disease. You see probably some long-standing sequela of end-stage renal disease. But if you scrutinize this CT a little closer, you see a hypodense lesion in the right parietal lobe here. On the coronal image, you see it again. It looks kind of rounded, a little bit of a hyperdense rim. Kind of looks similar to that tumor we saw in the temporal lobe. So we're going to go ahead and get an MRI to see if we can characterize this a little bit better. On flare, we have a T2 kind of intermediate lesion where we saw that rounded lesion on CT with some edema around it, so spreading into the adjacent posterior frontal lobe. On post contrast, we see a thin rim of enhancement with probably central non enhancement or necrosis. And on diffusion weighted imaging, it's extremely bright. This is a characteristic appearance of an abscess. Uh, this one turned out to be a fungal abscess, like after they got cultures. Infection is characterized by location. We saw an abscess there, probably some surrounding encephalitis in that case as well. If it's confined to the meninges or CSF, we'll call that meningitis. Uh, these are often seen in immunosuppressed patients. Now, many times you won't be able to give a specific diagnosis. You'll have to rely on MRI. Systemic uh, tests such as blood cultures, maybe CSF labs, they may have to do biopsy or aspiration of some fluid to make a diagnosis. So thanks for tuning into this video of some of the most common brain pathologies. The upcoming videos are going to have seven individual cases that you can scroll through on your own. You'll be able to view those uh, in your web browser. You'll be able to come back here and check out the explanations. So be sure to check those out. If you haven't checked out the earlier videos about uh, kind of general approaches to brain imaging, be sure to go back and take a look at those now. But thanks for tuning in today. If you don't already, like be sure to subscribe, hit the like button so that people are aware of these videos and be sure to come back and check out for new content uh, in the upcoming months. Thank you.